Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we will talk about assisted reproduction methods. First of all, what is assisted reproduction? It is when an infertile couple seeks out for medical help for induction of pregnancy through medical assistance. A couple is considered to be infertile if they have tried to conceive for one year or longer in the case they are under the age of 35 or if they have tried to conceive for a half a year if they are over the age of 35. We divide assisted reproduction into two major groups, in vivo fertilization and in vitro fertilization. In vivo means in the living, so the oocyte will be fertilized inside the mother's reproductive system, while in vitro means literally in the glass, and here the fertilization occurs in the laboratory and the fused oocyte and sperm will be transferred into the mother's uterus later on. Let's talk a little bit more about in vivo fertilization. So we know now that it is taking place inside the mother's reproductive system. In vivo fertilization is also called insemination because the sperm is placed into different locations of the female reproductive system by the help of a catheter. The most common location is intrauterine insemination. However, there are other ways. It is also possible to transfer the sperm into the fallopian tube. Then we call the process intratuber insemination. Intraperitoneal insemination occurs when, by help of cholesynthesis, the sperm is transferred into the peritoneum. This method is rarely used, but for completeness sake I wanted to mention it anyways. The idea of in vivo fertilization is to bypass certain barriers that the female reproductive system has for the sperm to overcome. The barriers that sperm has to overcome to reach the egg are the following. First, the acidic environment of the vagina. Then, the cervical mucus which filters immotile and dead sperm. And later on, they will encounter leukocytes, which can in some cases lead to anti-sperm antigen formation, which destroys the sperm. Also, the sperm has to bypass through the cervical canal, which is a narrow portion within the cervix. The uterus itself does not have an active barrier but it is quite a distance to travel through. As usually only one oocyte matures in one of the, fall, uh, of the two fallopian tubes, there will be no oocyte to encounter in the respective other fallopian tube. So the sperm has to choose the right fallopian tube to travel through. When the sperm finally reaches the egg, it still has to pass through the physical barrier of the zona pellucida. It is thought that the egg releases chemoattractants and chemorepellents, which are basically signals for some sperm to penetrate the egg and for damaged ones to be repelled. To facilitate fertilization, we can help the sperm to reach the egg by skipping some of these barriers with this catheter. And as said earlier, the most frequent place of insemination is into the uterus. We can also divide in vivo fertilization by the type of donor. Here we have two types, the homologue insemination and the heterologue insemination. In homologue insemination, the sperm originates from the husband or boyfriend. In heterologue insemination, the sperm is given by an unknown donor. Now let's say a few words about the process. As insemination has to be done when an egg is actually ready to be fertilized, we have to stimulate the ovaries by either giving 5 day long letrozole or 10 days of gonadotropins, starting 2 to 4 days after the first day of menstruation. In this time, we observe the maturation of the follicles daily. We can also measure ovulation 
by the help of blood tests and ultrasound. And once ovulation has occurred, insemination will follow, usually in a window of 12 to 36 hours. Before introducing the sperm into the uterus, it has to be collected, evaluated, and the equipment has to be prepared. Also the vagina and cervix will be cleaned properly, as an ascending infection to the uterus could lead to the necessity of a hysterectomy. The sperm will then be led into the uterus with a catheter. The success rate of in vivo fertilization depends largely on the age of the intended mother. If she is under 30 years, the success rate is around 20 to 25% per attempt. The rate declines drastically after the age of 35, where it is already only around 10%. Also, fertility is an important factor for success. If there is suspicion for idiopathic infertility of the mother with a healthy uterus, ovaries and fallopian tubes, the success rate is around te uh, 7 to 10 percent. It can be increased to 15 to 25 percent with the help of fertility medication. If the intended father has fertility problems, here the success rate is in average around 17 percent. The next type of assisted fertilization is in vitro fertilization. Here the oocyte and the sperm are fused in a laboratory and the embryo will be implanted into the uterus later. Today it is common practice to implant one, sometimes two, embryos, but usually not more than that. It is a three-step process of extracting the egg and sperm and evaluating them, then fertilization to occur and then the implantation. The official protocol for this three-step process is however complicated and has many sub-steps to it. The average success rate for in vitro fertilization is approximately 30% per attempt. To extract the oocyte, the menstrual cycle will be controlled medically. First, gonadotropin-releasing hormone is given to suppress the natural menstrual cycle. Then the ovaries are stimulated with follicle-stimulating hormone to bring many oocytes to mature. And when per ultrasound control maturation is detected, 5 to 12 oocytes are aspirated. Not all of them will be in the condition to be used. But the more oocytes are aspirated, the higher the chance of success. We divide in vitro fertilization into two types. The first one is the classical IVF, which is used when a spermiogram of the intended father shows no abnormalities. Here the sperm and oocyte are put together in a glass at 37 Celsius degree and are left for two days for spontaneous fertilization to occur. This has the advantage that Mother Nature, God, Biology, or whatever you choose to believe in, decides which sperm will fertilize the egg. This is also the major difference to the second type of in vitro fertilization, which is called ICSI. ICSI stands for Intracytoplasmic Sperm Injection. You can see it on the poster, and it is used when a spermiogram shows abnormalities and there is not enough morphologically healthy sperm for spontaneous fertilization to occur. Here one sperm is selected by the doctor and is injected into the oocyte with a micro needle. After fertilization occurred, it will be observed and if division happens as it should, the embryo will be implanted five to six days later. It is also possible to take one of the cells of the developing embryo to use it for cytogenetic analysis and to detect possible genetic abnormalities. That's it for this video. I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel, please subscribe.
Thank you very much.